My name is Frederick Gordon, and I'm talking today with Nelson Simone. Uh, Nelson is an old friend, and he is an accomplished videographer and storyteller. And uh, today, we're going to discuss a book that Nelson wrote called Soul of the Hurricane, The Perfect Storm and an Accidental Sailor. Uh, Nelson, you, of course, are the accidental sailor. And uh, it's a great story how you... Uh, got to be that way. Uh, I know that you started off uh, uh, with a very easy sailing trip with Pete Seeger on the Clearwater, but you graduated to something much greater. <laughs> yes. Tell, tell us how that came about. Okay, so uh, well, I'm going to read an excerpt from the book um, and let me set, set this up. Um, I had been to a um, a lecture at the Museum of Natural History uh, in New York City. And at the museum, my friends and I had been invited to crew on a 126-year-old uh, Norwegian schooner from Brooklyn to Bermuda. My friends jumped at the chance, and I couldn't figure out any way to get out of it. <laughs> and so I went along. Uh, so this excerpt picks up the next day when the three of us showed up at the boat yard where the, the ship was getting prepared for the trip. The next day, Thursday, October 24th, Peter, Mike, and I made our way to Mill Basin where the ship was in dry dock amid final preparations for the journey. Peter saw Anna Christina first at the far end of the yard. She was out of the water and the scaffolding looked like two huge hands holding her up like an offering. This would be Anna Christina's first trip without Norman, the owner, at the helm. Busy with lectures and other commitments, he had hired a young sailor, Joey Galband, to get her from Brooklyn to Bermuda. Norman would join the ship there to continue the trip to the Caribbean. As we stood on the dock, Joey approached us. He had some bad news. We're eight, he said. I need nine. I can only take one of you. I'll take the most experienced. I bit my lip, trying to figure out what expression I should have on my face. Surprised? Quizzical? Expectant? Who knew? Inside, I was dancing a jig because I knew that while Peter was a landlubber like me, except for those few outings with the bakers, Mike had been sailing his whole life. Sunnies, day sailors, dinghies, all kinds of small craft. I shrugged in what I hoped looked like disappointment. I've only had a week on the clear water. Joey scratched his beard stubble. Well, he said, the clear water has the same kind of rigging as Anna Christina. It's only a week, but you've still got more experience on a tall ship than these other two. And so I would go. Now time seemed to speed up as I was pulled forward in the wake of my predicament. Two hours later, I was on an Amtrak train to DC. I needed my passport, which was at my parents' house in Maryland. My parents were away and my sister Fatima, 15 years younger than me, was still at school, but my grandmother was home. Now, normally my grandmother was not one to be trifled with, but I was a man on a mission. I rang the doorbell. She opened the door, surprised to see me. She said, what are you doing here? Get out of my way, Abuela. I need my passport, I answered, as if that were all the explanation she needed. By this time, I was on autopilot because I could not allow myself to feel anything, much less think about the situation I had gotten myself into. I had to do this. I was going to do this. And if I let myself for a moment stop and think, it might be too much to bear. I got the passport, caught the next train back to New York, and spent a sleepless night in Brooklyn. As I lay there, I thought back to meeting Norman for the first time. I had been in the museum lobby after the presentation. 
and Marianne, his wife, had appeared at my shoulder with Norman in tow. He smiled warmly and shook my hand, told me how lucky they were to have someone with my experience aboard. Marianne informed Norman that no, I was not that Nelson, but I had volunteered for the trip. He let go of my hand and seemed to search for something to say, finally mumbled something I could not understand, then turned and walked away. I stood there with Marianne, a thin smile frozen on my lips. Oh God, I thought. The next morning I packed a small bag and made my way back to Mill Basin. And was it then that the, the ship took sail or did you? Yeah, I went back to Mill Basin and uh, got on the ship on a Friday and, uh, and we sailed. Uh, and actually we, uh, it, it seems that it's bad luck uh, to sail on a Friday. So we waited till just after midnight um, on the 25th, actually the 26th uh, to set sail. Uh, Nelson, what were you doing at the time when you agreed to uh, sign aboard this ship? What, what were your life circumstances at that moment? Well, at that time, I was uh, working in a, in a, uh, at a law firm. I was on the graveyard shift as a proofreader and uh, um, in, in a very large corporate firm. And uh, the graveyard shift was actually this amalgam of, of, of artists and writers and graduate students. So it was kind of all the folks that uh, had convinced ourselves that if we, if we worked a graveyard, we could spend the day doing uh, all the things we needed and wanted to do. Uh, we didn't fig factor in any sleep time, but that's what was happening. And these are the friends, these are the folks that I was, mm -hmm. uh, so the guys that had agreed to go on the trip were also from. I think remarkable, uh, Nelson, that you uh, met Norman and uh, literally within a week you were on the boat. Yeah, I didn't know Norman. I didn't know the family. This was really my friends that got me into this thing. And uh, as I said, when we when we walked into the the museum and Marianne, Norman's wife, came up and she was effusively recruiting people for the ship. She was inviting everybody and. Uh, Two of my friends jumped, Michael and Peter jumped to at the chance and another friend, Johnny, uh, who knew the, the bakers very well, he said no. And later I asked him, I said, how could you turn that down? And, and he said, I just didn't wanna go. And it was so easy for him. Now Nelson, you described yourself as being ambivalent but unable to say no. How, how is it that that came about? Um, I mean, I put it down to kind of surviving, you know, in this country, I came as an immigrant as a very small child, as a three-year-old, and uh, we really got along by getting, by going along. And so um, it was kind of in my nature to go along with things. Um, and so I thought, well, I'll go along with this. And uh, the adventure was supposed to be a, a trip to Bermuda, uh, but it turned out to be something very different. Mm -hmm. But uh, you you were up for an adventure, and why not? You were about thirty years old, and uh, you uh, didn't you say that you were a little bit nervous because the uh, there was a chasm in your life between you and a plan. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Uh, as I'd been growing up, I had been trying to figure out what what it was I should be doing, and mm -hmm. this is kind of where it found me at that point. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nelson, tell us a little bit about Norman Baker. Who who was this man that, that uh, had this boat, and and what was his background? Well, Norman was a remarkable, remarkable man. He had known from an early age that he wanted to sail, uh, that he wanted to sail the the seven seas, so to speak. He wanted to sail around the world, and uh, he had ended up uh, uh, on a uh, a destroyer during the Korean War, and that certainly wasn't the kind of sailing he wanted to do. So someone on the ship said, you've got to find uh, a sailing ship, that that's what you're really looking for. Mm -hmm. And um, so he had started sailing. He sailed all over the Pacific, um, and in those journeys, he met this man, Thor Heyerdahl, who was, a, at the time, wow. Thor had already 
sailed on the Contiki, which was uh, from the Easter Islands. He sailed a you know, kind of a raft across the Pacific. And Thor had all these theories about ancient peoples, you know, how had so many different cultures had such similarities. And he had theories that, uh, that people had sailed across the seas in ways we didn't imagine. And so he came up with the, uh, uh, at the time in the 60s, the, the Ra expedition, which had the, the theory that the Egyptians had per perhaps sailed across the Atlantic because that um, culture was so similar. There were such similarities with some of the peoples of the Americas. Mm -hmm. uh, and both had sort of pictures, hieroglyphics of these reed boats. Uh -huh. And uh, he thought that maybe they had sailed across that way. And so Norman ended up being the navigator on three different reed boat expeditions with Thor Heyerdahl. Um, the two Rot one and two, and the final reed boat expedition, which was the Tigris, which the went Tigris. from, from uh, the uh, Tigris and Euphrates River through the Red Sea. Um, it was their final their final mm -hmm. uh, journey. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and a remarkable man. And, and Norman, I take it, had uh, discovered this boat, the Anna Christine, and he had rigged it up to be a working sailboat again. Yeah, well, he and his, uh, he had met Mary and his wife uh, around that time, just before he took the, 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 um, the trips with Thor in the 60s. And they had both decided, Mary got caught up in his passion to circumnavigate the globe. And so that was a goal they both had. Uh, in the meantime, they had three children. Uh, so when Norman did the reed boat expeditions, he had, had these three young kids. And they, as a family, decided that someday they were going to find a vessel and they were going to go around the world. And so Norm, Mary Ann actually found Anna Christina in an ad in a boating magazine um, down in Tortola in the British Virgin Islands uh, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And they went down and uh, the whole family went down and started um, trying to get this boat back in shape, it was supposed to be a, a three month uh, endeavor to get her back in shape. Um, and three months became three more months and three more months. And they ended up spending four years of their lives wow. and everything they had. They sold their house, uh, they sold everything um, to, to uh, uh, refurbish this 123 year old school. Uh -huh. To get her and, the world. and the schooner was a good sized boat. I think you said it was 96 feet long. It was 96. I mean, it was an ocean going vessel, um, you know, from Norway. Yeah. Um, they, uh, as I tell in the book, they spent four years. Uh, the, the kids were down there from college. They finally went back to their lives. Norman and Marianne stayed there alone. And it was from 1982 to 1986. Finally, in 86, they were ready to go. And uh, they called the kids back. And they had two years of provisions on board. And they made it 10 miles um, before, their, uh, before their engine flamed out. Uh, and that was basically the end of that phase of the dream. Um, they got the ship back in shape, but they had abandoned the, the plans. And so as a Kind of a consolation in 1986 they they sailed her back to new york harbor uh for what was at that time called op sale 86 which was the 100th anniversary of the statue of liberty oh yeah so they had a great flotilla there in new york there were hundreds and hundreds of of sailing vessels and uh i think anna christina was the oldest by at least 25 or 30 30 years mm -hmm. so she was kind of the star of the flotilla mm -hmm. yeah yeah, and subsequently, didn't the Anna Christine, uh, wasn't that used as a charter boat frequently to they, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland? They started actually using it as a, a, a training vessel. So they, they had mm -hmm. a deal with the uh, Canadian government to train young uh, sea cadets. And so for since from 86 to 91, um, they sailed up and down the coast training these young cadets, you know, kids from 14 to 17 years old, um, learning how to sail on this, on this ancient vessel. Um, yeah. 
and, and then in 91, uh, Norman got the opportunity to book some um, um, scientific uh, journeys with Cornell University and other uh, uh, scientific entities to go back to the Caribbean. And so that was the, the beginning. So this was going to be the beginning of of that dream. Like he wanted to, he had never lost the dream of circumnavigating. Mm -hmm. And so our job in October of 1991 was to make the eight day trip from Mill Basin in Brooklyn and to get the ship down to Bermuda. And that's what I got swept mm -hmm. up in. <laughs> you did. And uh, yeah. describe the first couple of days. Wasn't it the didn't it seem like ideal sailing conditions at first? Yeah, at first, uh, one of the, the, the sailors, so there were nine of us on board. There was uh, Joey Gale, there were three professional sailors. Joey Galband was the captain. Uh, then he had a first mate, which a young woman. And the second mate was this, this young kid named uh, Damien Sailors, who was 19 years old. Um, and then the six of the rest of us of varying levels of, of experience and proficiency. I was not surprisingly the, the least experienced and the last one added uh, to, the, uh, to the crew. And uh, so we set sail um, on uh, just after midnight on Saturday, the 26th of October and uh, woke up the next day and it was glorious. You know, um, one of the crew members said you, you sail a lot of crappy days for one day like this. Uh, it was beautiful sun, beautiful breeze. All the sails were unfurled. I mean, it looked like a, a picture postcard. Um, yeah. And uh, one of the guys on ship was a gourmet chef and he was just serving up this amazing food. And I was eating like no tomorrow and noticing that people, you know, back then we didn't talk about hydrating. Mm -hmm. but I did notice people were drinking a lot of water and I did not really understand why um, until later when I started getting seasick and feeling worse and worse so I paid for that uh, uh, yeah. and uh, that first day was amazing yeah uh, Nelson uh, you had no idea that a hurricane was in the the near future I assume it, it was unusual wasn't it in terms of the normal time of yeah. a hurricane. Yeah, well, yeah. people have, have asked me over the years because of what happened, you know, that we ran into Hurricane Grace to the south and the nor'easter from the north. And mm -hmm. people have said, how could someone with Norman's experience of sailing and uh, have, how could he have imagined going at that time? And the, the, the sort of common sense uh, and the sort of uh, uh, saying that sailing people in New England had is by October, it's over. You know, by October, it's over. That by October, the hurricane season had ended and the nor'easter season hadn't yet begun. And so to leave at the end of October uh, in, in Norman's thinking was the, the perfect window um, to get down there before, after the hurricane season and before the, the northern storms would begin. And, you know, I have to say, I didn't know at the time, but I mean, looking back and in the research I've done, I think, you know, 999 times out of a thousand, that would have been true. And this was the one time it wasn't, you know. Uh, no, uh, Nelson, just for anyone who may not know, describe briefly, what is a hurricane? Why, why is a hurricane so phenomenal an event? Uh, a hurricane is the most potent um, natural phenomenon in the world. It carries, uh, you know, a, a typical hurricane carries literally, you know, three trillion watts of power. It is the most mm -hmm. powerful thing that you can, that happens on the earth. Um, and they most... Atlantic hurricanes start with uh, uh, breezes and winds from Africa, 
and they they come across and if the conditions are are right if you have the the the, the proper moisture and movement of air um, then a hurricane can form it'll start very slowly uh, it'll start turning um, and if it builds enough um, uh, water, if it can take in, because the um, basically what, what a hurricane is doing is the winds are turning, they start turning, and north of the equator, they turn counterclockwise. Mm -hmm. South of the equator, they turn clockwise. And so they turn counterclockwise and they start funneling mm -hmm. water and air and energy. Literally, they're taking energy from the ocean to, to feed uh, this phenomenon that goes up, you know, 90 or 100 miles up into the atmosphere. So in other words, a hurricane is, especially as you experienced it, not only is a phenomenon of wind and air and lightning and rain, but it's also a turbulent sea, an incredibly turbulent sea. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So that, that adds a dimension to it. Yeah, very much so. Uh, Nelson, you had, like many of us, had a peripheral uh, experience with hurricanes in the past. What, what was that earlier uh, brushing with hurricanes that you had experienced? <laughs> well, in the book, I talk about, you know, and it's interesting how these things sort of line up, but I, I, there are three instances in, in my past from the time I was seven years old to the time I was in my 20s. Uh, there are three different hurricanes that touched my life in some way. Um, and I write about them in, in different sections. I call these, when I was writing them, I called them the hurricane vignettes because they're little vignettes that are uh, kind of a look into my early life and into mm -hmm. my kind of uh, connection to, to this phenomenon, you know, earlier in my life. So the first time I was, the first time I was seven years old and my family was took a trip to Miami Beach and we had very little money and we arrived and we were there one day and came down from the hotel and uh, they were boarding up the hotel and uh, they told us we had to leave. Uh, so we started driving home and ended up the only car on the highway. I was seven, you know, so I'm watching my parents and we didn't know what a hurricane was. We came from a landlocked country. My parents didn't know what it was until a a deserted highway, this police car pulled us over and, uh, you know, asked us what, what, the, what the hell we were doing, basically. And mm -hmm. you know, my parents said, we we're trying to get home. And he said, no, you've got to take shelter as quickly as you can. So, uh -huh. Do you recall seeing uh, palm trees down and all kinds of... Uh... <laughs> well, to be honest, uh, you know, with a child's eye, the way I remember it is we got to this motel and we were looking out the window and what it looked like to me was the scene from the Wizard of Oz uh -huh. <laughs> when everything is swirling and and things are being lifted. So I, I, I don't think I remember the actual hurricane, but in my mind, it looks just like the witch and Dorothy uh -huh. and all these things kind of being. Nelson, you describe a, your, another adventure with a hurricane when you were probably just a few years older and you uh, kind of watched the hurricane out of a window that was in your parents' uh, closet or bedroom. Uh, yeah. And uh, you, you it's, it was a very poignant uh, view of the small child looking at nature. Yeah, well, that was Hurricane Agnes. I was 13 and uh, at a very difficult kind of crossroads in my life uh, as a child mm -hmm. and kind of feeling um, that, I didn't know how to express to my parents the struggles I was having. And I remember being at a window and having read about this hurricane and, and the storm. I think it was a tropical storm by the time it reached us in Maryland. So I had mm -hmm. followed the progress of this storm as it came up the coast and I was waiting for it um, and waiting to see what it would do because out the back, of that window, we had a ravine that had often in big storms had filled up with water and had become what looked to me like a, a raging river. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what I wanted as a child, but I wanted something. I, I wanted the storm to do something to change things, to mm -hmm. cleanse things in some way. 
Oh, you you, you speak, Nelson, when you were a, a child on a trip with your mother, grandmother to Rehoboth Beach, and uh, you describe almost, I won't say a mystical experience, but you had a sense in seeing the beach and the horizon. It was the time of the moonwalk, I believe. Yeah. You, you had a feeling that something bigger was happening to you, something that was imminent in your life. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think that, I, again, I was very caught up in, this was in 1969, so I was 10 years old, um, very caught up in the moonwalk, but it happened that we ended up at the beach that day, and I remember the first time seeing the ocean and just getting a sense of how big the universe was, how big the ocean was, how small we were, and yeah. kind of picturing myself and picturing those men up circling the, the moon at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, Nelson, it, it never occurred to you, I assume, that anything disastrous could happen, that uh, you, you, you went into this adventure with a complacent uh, air of uh, expecting a good time? Um, well, that's a hard question. I guess I, I went into this adventure with some kind of underlying excitement and uh, a funny kind of resignation, I would say, that I had decided to go. Uh, I was kind of trying to give myself over to the experience. Um, and yeah, I, I had a one-way ticket back. I had my passport. I had a one-way ticket back from Bermuda. Hmm. So I thought we would have, yeah, in my mind, I was trying to make it feel like a pleasure trip, right? Eight days on a sailing ship and as they say, the what could possibly go wrong? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's when, so we had that perfect day of sailing. Uh, and then by that night, so this was sort of the Saturday night, I started feeling sick and didn't want to eat anymore. And I sat on the, um, uh, I sat on the deck because I didn't want to go below deck. I wanted that fresh air, you know, and uh, that's the first inkling we had I think that's the first radio contact we had that there was something happening down around Bermuda that a storm had formed uh that it had actually been given a name uh Grace Grace um, mm -hmm. yeah and uh but we didn't change anything at that point uh we were still on course um and we woke up the next day on Sunday and Joey had gotten the crew together. The, the, the eight of us were together and um, he told us what was happening. He told us we were going to adjust our course slightly to the east mm -hmm. to, to skirt around the storm. And he looked so confident and everyone looked kind of excited because the weather was getting more serious. And uh, I will tell you, I've never heard a sailor or a sailing person uh, uh, reminisce about the sunny days they've had. You know, they always reminisce about the hard days. At the so store. Everyone's pretty excited. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so we were. I went up. I remember being on deck, and Joey was at the helm, and uh, I was working with preparing some gas pump that we would later use. And uh, you know, the wind was whipping. The water was starting to whip off the tops mm -hmm. of the waves, and it was very exciting. And um, I realized in that moment that I didn't feel sick anymore. You know, suddenly I, I don't know if it was the adrenaline or I was, you know, kind of excited mm -hmm. and I realized I hadn't eaten anything since the day before. And so uh, Marty, the chef had, had prepared this, this beef broth and these uh -huh. mugs for us. And I just remember drinking that broth and just like it was the brothiest broth I had ever had, you know, all my senses were just, alive and excited um and so that was like the next stage of um, feeling like okay we're gonna have this exciting moment and uh, we'll still get to bermuda and everything's okay nelson you describe yourself as a child of the television age and uh, what as a result what, what did you expect uh, well really it's true i i really felt like that 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 was the perspective I had that the reality that something can go wrong, you know. I'd grown up on on television shows, uh, uh, adventure shows, 
uh, scary shows, all kinds of shows where things go very badly in the middle and then they're resolved by the end. And so that was kind of my attitude. I said, well, you know, there's this storm, Joey's in charge um, and it'll be kind of like a roller coaster ride, but we'll get out the other end. And that's, Not that's what it looked like. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yet, Nelson, the way you uh, describe the course of the storm and where you went, that turn to the east was a fateful maneuver, a fateful mistake, you might say. Yeah, later, later we realized. I mean, I, th I think that, um, you know, the, I, I didn't know this at the time, but the, the, the sort of, um, uh, you know, common sense that sailors know that because, because the storm is churning, um, uh, counterclockwise, mm -hmm. that uh, that most storms, it's turning in that direction. Most storms will start out uh, heading west, but three quarters of them will eventually turn east. Mm -hmm. And so, when we thought we were skirting the storm, we were actually, you know, go, going toward the the sort of uh, the wheelhouse. Right. Of the storm. In fact, what the real. I don't think we realized the scope of it in how large. No, but there was another sailing ship who was at the same time, and they actually turned west, not east. And yes, uh, uh, yeah. In, what, in researching the book, I tracked down the captain. Uh, Greg Swayze was the captain of the Ernestina, and that was mm -hmm. a uh, a very similar vessel. It was another schooner. Uh, it was a training vessel. And they were actually sailing the same route. They were going from further north from up in Boston to Bermuda, and eventually they were gonna sail across the Atlantic. Um, and they were a, a day ahead of us. They left the day before. Uh-huh, that made a big uh, difference. It made a difference and they had a crew of 35. You know, they had a crew of, I think, uh, 11 instructors. Uh, they had an engineer who was taking care of the, the pumps, which were very important. And Greg told me that as soon as they saw that there was any kind of disturbance to the south, they immediately made a 90 degree turn and started sailing west. Um, mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think that's what we should have done, but we didn't. Now, something unusual you point out that Norman Baker was not on the ship the first time really that he was not aboard his own vessel. And yet uh, Joey, the captain was not in touch with Norman and, and that, was unusual, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think that was, uh, again, in retrospect, that became a, a, a contentious point. Uh, Norman felt in retrospect, you know, after all that happened, that we should have contacted him. He felt he could have talked us through um, the storm. Uh, Joey was a very experienced sailor, but he had only recently gotten his, uh, his sailors, his captain's license. Uh, he was very, you know, 27 year old, um, you know, a little full of himself. I mean, I think he felt he could get through anything. Uh, yeah. and that and the fact that, you know, before very long, we were in pretty dire straits. And so I think the, the notion of taking the time to, to call Norman and, and who was so far away just never occurred to him. Uh, but Norman mm -hmm. felt that that if we had, it was his ship. He knew it well, and that he could have talked us through whatever mm -hmm. we needed. So that was nothing. Something that was never resolved between the two of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, you describe a moment when the the good feeling that the crew had was suddenly replaced by fear and a sense yeah. almost of subdued panic. Yeah. What, yeah. What, it's what interesting because. Well, you know, I described that first morning. So this was Sunday morning, uh, going from Saturday to Sunday, when Joey got the crew together. And that was that sense of excitement and um, of adventure. And I was still on deck at the time, even as the least experienced. We were slowly uh, unfurling, uh, or furling, I should say. We were removing sails to keep control of the ship. Um, so 24 hours go by and we keep getting reports that the storm is getting worse and worse. And, you know, it finally is categorized as hurricane level, hurricane grace. And 
one thing about grace is it wasn't, uh, it was a, a category one, which is above 75 miles an hour with, mm-hmm. with uh, gusts up to 100. So it wasn't the most powerful hurricane, but it was enormous as it turned yeah. out. It was a huge storm. And um, so Monday morning, Joey called us back together again. And in that second meeting, there I could see the, the tautness in people's faces, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the tautness in his voice as he kind of laid out that we were going to, now we were going to turn west and north to try to outrun the storm. Uh, we were kind of going into an emergency mode where um, most of us, the, only the most experienced sailors would be on deck. Uh, we ran a lifeline around the, the perimeter of the deck. And so what pe- everyone was clipped in at all times if they were up there. Um, the, the ship was taking on water. We couldn't tell how exactly, but we knew that there was water coming on. Later, we realized that there was there were vents that had not been properly closed. There were things we didn't do properly. Uh, and so we were taking on water. Um, and I do remember there was one of us, I was no longer seasick, but another one of us had gotten really sick. And he was in one of the, the cabins just moaning and moaning. And I remember <laughs> I felt no humanity. <laughs> you know, I just wanted him to shut up because it felt like that would be contagious. I felt like- Yeah, not good I for cannot, my pal. I, we cannot go there with you. So we just yeah. wanted someone to shut him up yeah. so we wouldn't feel that. So. Nelson, what was it like to look out a porthole or even when you were on deck at first to see waves that were 30, 40, 50 feet high? How did yeah, you I, feel? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, I, I mean, my, my most- vivid uh, sort of sense feeling was that that you know we would go up there would be a moment as you're as you're kind of cresting the wave and as you're cresting it's almost like that free fall moment when when you feel your in your chest that moment of like you lose your breath you know and then you're coming back down uh, so I remember that very vividly I remember the colors of the waves as they came up and crested, they were, you know, they would come up blue-green and then crest over us. Um, I remember the sounds of the ship, you know, these wooden ships are so resilient. They're, they're so amazing in these storms because they're made of wood. I mean, these ships can survive so much because they can, they bend and give in, mm-hmm. in the winds. And but you could hear the ship creaking, you know. I, I think you used to say screaming. The, 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 the timbers were screaming as yeah, they were. Exactly. That, yeah. And you just didn't know how much they had left to give. You didn't know when the last one would be, when, when, the, when would be the last one. You know, these were yeah. the feelings that I was having. Um, Nelson, and, at, what, at what point did uh, Joey call in? Uh, I, the Coast Guard, or at what point did someone come out and look look to see where you were? So now we're we're on Monday. So Monday morning, uh, he called that meeting. Uh, the the four or five most experienced sailors were were on deck. The rest of us were below deck, trying to help in any way that we could. Um, and uh, early that afternoon of that Monday, Joey called in. Um, to let the Coast Guard know that we were we were sailing. He said we weren't in trouble, that we were sailing well, but that we were trying to make our way back toward the coast. And mm-hmm. uh, within two or three hours, he called again and said that we were in trouble. Uh, and so at that point, the Coast Guard sent uh, a C-130. Those are the, the airplanes that they send out. They're actually, uh, they send them into hurricanes because they fly so mm-hmm. well. Um, they sent one out to check on our uh, on our condition and to see how we were doing. Um, and then by six o'clock, he sent out a, an SOS. And um, at that point, they sent um, another plane because part of what was happening was that our our pumps weren't weren't pump weren't keeping up. They weren't pumping the water out, so the, mm-hmm. the ship was filling. We're sailing, trying to stay afloat, 
Um, so the Coast Guard figured if they could get us one of these these super pumps, they're just these amazing pumps that that uh, if they could land one on the ship, then that would be enough to give us uh, a leg up on mm -hmm. the on the water and to to help us keep sailing. And so they sent this what C one thirty, and um, I remember Joey was at the radio and uh, Peter Abelman, who was one of the crew, uh, he went out to the very prow of the ship and he was clipped in and he had like a 10 foot hook. Um, and Joey was in communication and he yells out to him, pump coming down. You know, they saw the plane, the pump comes yeah. down and Peter's thinking, where? And it turns out that they had dropped the pump to a, a trawler that was uh, riding out the storm, you know, several miles from us. Mm -hmm. you know? and then so they, they tried back, four you know, times too, right? Say that they, again. Yeah, they came back they, and the, uh, you know, the, the plane is flying at 150 feet, you know, off the surface and, you know, our, our uh, masts are 78, 90 feet. So they're trying to, to come down as low as they can and still sit, stay safe. And so they, they made, I think, 15 passes Wow. And, uh, to try to, you know, they had two more pumps left. They dropped the second one and they dropped it just behind us, but we couldn't go back. And then the last one, their last shot, they dropped it. They dropped it in front of us and Peter went to, to grab it with the hook. You know, it's got lines on it. Yeah. And he's trying not to get pulled over. Uh, and he finally, he had to let go of the hook. Oh. It just went too much. And so that was basically our last shot at those mm -hmm. um, the c-130 took off after that yeah yeah it's, it's remarkable that you make the point that a boat however much uh water it takes on if it can be pumped out the boat can still float and and sail but uh you have to get the water out right yeah, yeah. peter swayze the the captain of the ernestina uh, i'm sorry um greg swayze made that point with me is that old boats take on water, you know, the, the, to varying degrees. Uh, and you just need to be on top of it. And that's that was the difference between Ernestina and us is they had an, an engineer just taking care of their pumps. They had, again, as I said, a crew of 35 spelling each other, you know, keeping up with uh, everything that they needed to. Mm -hmm. and we had a crew of nine uh, and we were just, you know, I think redlining. Much and you were you were amateurs virtually men, many of you for sure yeah well yeah me and for now, sure once once the uh, once the pumps were lost as it were or not not delivered to you how many hours more did it take before you were in touch with the coast guard again well we were in touch i mean once we got in touch with them we stayed in contact in, in constant mm -hmm. contact with them but at that point um this was, I mean, kind of concurrent with that, Joey had asked, because the Coast Guard will wait, you know, they'll wait until you ask to be taken off, because they're not going to go and rescue people who don't want rescuing. So it was really Joey's decision at a certain point to weigh uh, saving the ship or, or, you know, saving the crew. Um, and, and how do you balance those two things? So at a certain point, he decided uh, that he, he would ask them to take us off. And so he radioed to them. Um, and at first, uh, they, they weren't sure what to do because we were out of range of their helicopter, the, the helicopter. You, you were approximately 300 miles east of North Carolina. Right. In the, in the ocean. So that's a long way. Right. And in, in that kind of storm, um, that they would not have had enough fuel to come out, rescue us, and then get back. And so what they do, the Coast Guard doesn't wait for things. So once we asked to be lifted out, they just went into action. And so um, a hurricane took off with uh, this Captain Paul Lang uh, and then a crew of three. So there's Captain Lang, the co-captain, uh, a swimmer, and a hoist operator and mechanic. And so they took off not knowing what they were going to do. But in the meantime, uh, the, the folks on the ground were looking for what they call a lily pad. 
which is a place for the helicopter to land and refuel. Yeah. And so they're looking and uh, luckily they were able to find uh, that the USS America, an aircraft carrier, US Amer uh, aircraft carrier was riding out the storm, you know, a couple of hundred miles off the coast. Mm -hmm. And uh, they requested clearance to land and refuel. And the captain said, if, if you guys are crazy enough to go out in this, I'm, I'm not going to let, I'm not going to leave you out there. So he allowed the helicopter uh, to land on deck and they refueled so that he could keep going. Now, I should say that the helicopter was designed for six people. And since there were nine of us, uh, the idea was to send a second helicopter to pick up, you know, the remaining people. The yeah. second helicopter just went out almost immediately. They lost all their, their uh, instruments. Um, so mm. in short, uh, that one helicopter was our one hope. And so they were the ones they radioed that they were coming to get us. Mm -hmm. Nelson, in, in the epilogue of the book, you describe your uh, research really into how the Coast Guard had pulled this all together. And it's a remarkable story. And uh, this Commander Lang, uh, you, you were very fortunate. He apparently was the, the number one man for conducting helicopter rescues. And luckily he was on your side. Right. Yeah, he he's a very, very humble man. It was a, a real pleasure and privilege to sit down with him 30 years later. And, you know, I interviewed him for three or four hours. Uh, very humble guy, um, you know, just wouldn't really talk too much about his own abilities. Luckily, Dave Morgan, who was his co-pilot at the time, he said, well, he's top gun. He's the best. You know, mm -hmm. we were very lucky to have have yeah. on our side. Yeah. yeah. And so they were coming out and uh, they radioed ahead uh, and told us they refueled on the aircraft carrier. Um, luckily, Joey had had the wherewithal to hang a bunch of lights from our rigging to help them find us in the dark, because at this point they're flying toward us after midnight mm. uh, and trying to find us in the middle of a storm. And Was so... And, and uh, it was still raining and pretty bad. Well, one thing that happened that, you know, I think a lot of things came together that were really fortuitous for us. And one of them was uh, that as Grace was, was coming and we were finally had turned west and we're going in that direction, uh, she did turn to the east. The nor'easter came down. And in some way, the nor'easter and the hurricane met at that point and the whole system turned away from us. And so it gave us a respite. It gave us a, a little time when things weren't so severe. I mean, it was still bad, but it wasn't the worst of it. And so it gave us a window for the helicopter to come. Um, and so at a certain point after midnight, Joey came down uh, and he said, they've, they've come to get us, you know? And so I immediately started packing my bags <laughs> and uh, he just laughed and he said, no, 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 just your life, just your life. Nelson, I, I know when you packed your bags, you were discouraged. Some, Joey told you, just take what you need to live, nothing more. Exactly, yeah, yeah. no bag. <laughs> so, <laughs> Did you ever take your passport with you? Was I that think uh, I, I kept the passport, I had a credit card, uh, for some reason, I didn't have my driver's license. I left, I, I had my house keys and I kind of weighed them in my hand and decided <laughs> I wasn't taking the chance. So I left those too. And uh, that's what I took in my, I had a little pouch. Um, so I came up to the deck and it was my first time on deck in oh, wow. uh, 14 mm -hmm. hours. And uh, it just looked, I, I have to say it looked like some kind of wild carnival atmosphere because the helicopter was there and the, the, they were shining their their midnight sun their mm -hmm. light on us and uh everyone was very calm you know we were we were all clipped in um and that's one thing i have to say about the crew and about joey there was never ever ever uh any panic there was never any you know i think it was really 
a remarkable group of people that, you know, people who didn't know each other at all. And we just came together in a way that mm -hmm. we were going to keep each other alive. You know, Nelson, what, what position were you in terms of jumping off the boat for rescue? Weren't you like fourth in line? It was fourth in line that we were, we were literally queued up along the rail, waiting our turn. And, uh, uh, as it turned out, because of the rigging and the, the masts and the ship, you know, swinging back and forth, the mm -hmm. helicopter couldn't take us off the deck. So they informed us that we would have to jump off the ship one at a time, and then the helicopter would go back and fish that person out, and they would come back and get the next one. And so uh, the first person was uh, Langdon, who was the guy who had been sick, and... Yeah. Uh, Joy wanted to get him off board. And um, we remember Lang Langdon got up on the rail and I couldn't hear him, but I could hear Joey just yelling at him, not yelling. He was trying to, to talk to him in a way to not panic him, but make it clear to him that he had to go, that it was time to go, you know, because I think it, it was, as we all were, we were afraid to take that step. Yeah. And so finally Langdon went off and he just, Fred, he just disappeared. I mean, that's when I realized how fast we were moving because, you know, relative, the helicopter and the ship were moving together. But once that, that person got in the water, he just disappeared into the darkness. Go on. Yeah. And the helicopter peeled off. And, you know, we didn't know uh, whether he was going to find him or not. So we just had to wait. Yeah. Um, and it took him... Paul to told me later, it took him 10 minutes to get Langdon, and that was too long. Mm -hmm. So we had to find ways to, to move it faster. Right. It was too long because they didn't have that much of a fuel supply. So exactly. you really had to, it, it, with 10 minutes per person would have been too yeah, much. No, it wasn't going to yeah. make it. So they had a very specific window. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nelson, yeah. now when you jumped off the boat, you had a tremendous surprise. And what was that? It, it, it struck me very vividly. Right. I remember jumping off. I remember in my mind that I was going into the Atlantic, that it was just going to be a shock, a shock of coldness and wondering how I could survive that. And I jumped off and it was just as it was like warm bath water. It was just as warm as could be. And that's when I realized we were in the Gulf Stream. And so there was a certain release when I jumped. I really felt like um, that I could survive. I felt suddenly it was, it was, I was able to let go because, you know, for 30 hours we had been trying so hard with everything we had, not just to do things, but to keep our spirits up and to keep, you know, mm -hmm. believing that we would get through this and to keep trying and you know suddenly it wasn't uh it wasn't in my hands anymore and so either I was going to make it or I wasn't but it was up to Paul Lang and whoever was going to fish me out you know mm -hmm. and so I felt like I could stay there a long time because I was floating uh, I had a life vest on I had a little light to help them find me I had a whistle uh, but they came back According to Paul, after, I thought I was in there a long time. According to Paul, they got back to us in 30 seconds like that. That's wow, quickly. that's amazing. Yeah. 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 And what had happened was, so uh, they had fished Langdon out with the swimmer. So the swimmer would, would dive in and he would help the person get into the basket. So it worked with him. He got the next person. Um, uh, in who was Barbara, one of the women on board, and uh, they they hoisted the swimmer up, and the the protocol is for the captain to say, "Are you good to go?" And the swimmer said, "Yeah, I'm good to go." But the mechanic said, "No, he's not," and he was in control because he's on he's at the the opening of the helicopter, and the swimmer was was throwing up. He was completely sick, hmm. uh, and he said, "This guy can't go back in." So from that moment on, uh, we uh, didn't uh, uh, have the, the swimmer. Each one of us had to find our way back into the, the basket alone. And we were able to. They, they lowered it down. We got up and they hoisted us up. 
you you made it that someone said that they had had near death experience and you said well this wasn't exactly the same because this wasn't something that happened in just a few, uh, a, a second or a few seconds this is something right. that endured for at least 30 hours yeah i mean that's something that struck me over the years because when i've told people about this experience you know, people want to share theirs. And I've, so I've sp spoken to a lot of people who are in auto accidents or accidents of one type or another where their, their lives were in danger or maybe they came close to, to dying. And uh, that, the distinction that I make is that, that those experiences happen very quickly uh, and they are horrible for a moment, um, but that this was kind of facing our mortality for 30 hours and, mm -hmm. and trying to uh, kind of both stay alert and stay functioning and, and keep trying, you know, um, for 30 hours. And that's a distinction in my mind. Yeah. One, one point that struck me is that this was, as you mentioned, the oldest continuous sailing boat really in, in the world at the time. Yeah. And, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson makes the point sometime, at some point in his essay on history that the hours of our day are often connected to the work of centuries, to, the, the, to man. As, and, and, and how do you feel that you were literally one of the last people on a boat that had sailors on it for 125 years? How do you... Yeah. How does that make you feel? You were the last crewman, one of the last. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that, that came home to me, I, I think in some of the, you know, even though we lost the ship, um, that the memories when I talked to Norman afterward, uh, his memories of, of the time they had, Anna Christina, some of the happiest were the really the Canadian sea cadets uh, and the the pleasure of, of introducing those young people to, you know, the wonders of the sea and the wonders of sailing and the wonders of this beautiful, beautiful ship. Um, and that's the, 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 the biggest thing that came home to me that I didn't realize when I stumbled into this experience was the community uh, that had grown up around this, this ship that was magical that when they sailed her up and down the coast um, all those years, uh, that people would come, you know, in New York City where I live, uh, South Street Seaport, the word would get out and people would say, you've got to come and see this ship. You've got to mm -hmm. come and see her. You know, it's just a, a, a magic ship. And when we got together, uh, the, the, the bakers after the rescue, literally within a week or so, um, they felt there was a need for something, you know, there was a need for people to come together. So at their home in West, Western Massachusetts, they had a kind of a reunion, a morning, a, a celebration, call it what you will, of everyone and anyone who wanted to, that had had a connection. And 150 people showed up at their home wow. and told stories and you know, cried together, had anecdotes, um, yeah. uh, you know, kind of sent off this this beautiful ship um, that yeah. uh, that had been lost. So wow. Okay, well, Nelson Simone, this has been a great pleasure to talk with you, and it's a, a wonderful book. And thank you for sharing.